Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt from Studio North. North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum wants to be the President of the United States. He joins me now. Good morning, Governor. How are you? Good morning, Hugh. Great to be on the show with you. Thank you for joining me. Governor, you and I are about the same age. I'm about five months older than you, so we've had the same lived experience. I want to ask you about that and how your politics changed, but i got to start with the lead story, which is the indictment of Donald Trump last week. What do you make of that indictment? What do you think candidates should say about it? What are you going to campaign on in regards to it? Well, I think the the key thing uh, from having been on the ground in both Iowa and New Hampshire in the last week is uh, an understanding that there are a lot of Americans that uh, have a real concern that we've got a double standard going on in America and that there's a one set of rules for Republicans and one set of rules for Democrats. And when we have this distrust at the very core level, at the citizen level of our institutions, uh, it shakes the very foundation of our country. And, and so I, I think it, it's, a, it's an unfortunate thing, the spot that we're in right now. But in terms of you know, our campaign, we're going to be you know, talking to people that matter most, the issues that matter the most, the most number of people. And people right now are really concerned about the economy, inflation. They're concerned about energy and energy prices. And they're concerned about national security and specifically concerned about the border. And so those are the things that we're we're talking to people on the ground. And uh, it's really resonating. uh, Governor Burgum, you remember when Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon because you're my age. So you remember it. Uh, You will be asked. I'm going to ask you first. If you're elected president, will you pardon Donald Trump? Well, this, these are the kind of hypothetical questions that I got asked when I was running for governor and have been you know, asked when I was re- getting reelected as governor by the largest margin in the country. And it's not something that I, I do. I mean, from a leadership standpoint, uh, you're asking me a hypothetical question about something from two years from now when we don't even know uh, if this is going to go forward, if there's even going to be a conviction. So I, I think I just intend to stay away from hypotheticals, whether it's, hey, will you sign a bill? And the bill isn't even at my desk, and it's going to have a hundred twists and turns before that. So again, we're we're focused on the future, uh, and focused on these issues of of economy, energy, and national security that are the things that that we know that we can do something about uh, right you know right now. And if someone if you want to ask someone about pardoning uh, President Trump, I mean, ask ask Biden. He could do it right now, and then the nation could get back and focusing on on the things that do matter the most, the most number of Americans. It's very interesting. There are only two questions or two answers. You gave the one I would give, which is that is so far removed from what matters to Americans. I am not going to be drawn into Trump hypotheticals for the next year and a half. The other one is yes. Some people say, yes, I will pardon him. Other people do what you did. I think yours is probably more prudent, uh, but it may change. We'll see. Let's get to the the big stuff. Uh, Because you are my age, you saw the Soviet Union fall. Marco Rubio was on yesterday talking about the mistake that our generation made in thinking the end of history, Francis Fukuyama's book had arrived. When the Soviet Union fell apart, what did you think would happen with China and the rest of the world? Well, the first thing, let me just say, the when it when it fell apart, it was an uh, interesting time because we were in the, you know, I'd, my, I'd grown up in a small town. My dad passed away when I was a freshman in high school. I took the farmland. I mortgaged the farm, a little bit of ground that I had. That became the seed capital for a company called Great Plains Software. We went from less than 10 people to over 2,000, we ended up with customers in over 130 countries around the world. And, you know, we built this 2,000 person company, you know, largely with small town kids from from the Midwest. But when the when it fell, one of the first countries that we went into was uh, Poland. Uh, I had a chance to get there shortly after the the uh, Eastern Europe was opening up. I had a chance when I was traveling with the North Dakota National Guard in the nineteen uh, in the nineteen eighties to actually go through Checkpoint Charlie. I mean, I saw the difference between West Berlin and East Berlin, and what communism can do in going from a thriving West German economy into a East German economy that was frozen in nineteen forty six kind of time frame. So I yes, I it was an interesting time because it was. Very exciting and opening, but the, one of the mistakes we made, of course, when the Soviet Union collapsed, their economy uh, was a not that large of economy when the Soviet Union collapsed, and they were trying to run it as a centralized economy. And like say today in America, healthcare 
a four trillion dollar economy is twice the size of what the Soviet Union was when it collapsed. And then here we think in America that somehow in this in a where the world's been lifted up by you know free markets and and innovation, not regulation, that somehow you know we can pick an industry as complex and as changing as healthcare and say we can centrally uh, you know centrally run that and have one federal system. So it seems like sometimes we don't learn. The, the lessons of history, and one of the lessons of history is that it's that you can't you can't centrally manage economies. Did you anticipate that China would turn from Mao's you know bicycles and peasants wearing hats into Xi's ominous presence across the globe? I mean, did you see it coming? Well, I, again, as a uh, as a as a fresh student in 1980 was the first time. I went to China. I was, you know, right right out of grad school. My first trip there in business was 1989. Again, same thing. When the world was opening up and we were starting to build our international presence in software, I stopped in China on the way back from Australia, went to a street market, and again, we had not, we were not yet selling our product overseas. Went to a street market. I heard you could buy software there, American software. I went. And I said, Hey, do you have great planes? as kind of a half of a joke. And the guy went over and pulled out some five and a quarter inch floppies for a buck a piece. And so there was pirated copies of our software made in North Dakota in China in 1989 wow. when we weren't even selling overseas. So everything I've ever made, I know that they've pirated. And so I always understand that we've been, been losing the battle as a country in terms of protecting our intellectual property. And China uh, was you know, gonna steal, steal our innovation as an effort to try to catch up. Uh, but when you've got 1.4 billion people, they've got a lot of challenges in front of them. So, Governor, uh, one of the things we also let our guard down on is on national security. And we have underfunded defense. North Dakota doesn't go quickly with national defense. If you're going to have to reallocate funding among the legs of the triad, which is the most important in your view? Well, for, first, uh, I'll reject the premise. Uh, North Dakota's got two of the three legs of the triad right here in North Dakota. We've got both a missile wing and a bomber wing in North Dakota at Minot. We've also got uh, the one of the most important uh, Air Force bases in Grand Forks that's, you know, doing global UAS work. And then the North Dakota National Guard, which, you know, one of the greatest honors of being governor uh, is to be the, you know, be the commander in chief. And we've got our own, you know, 119th wing uh, here in Fargo, North Dakota, that's actually flying live missions for the Air Force on UAS uh, with those pilots being stationed here, but remotely piloting aircraft in the Middle East. And uh, I I joke, we've got Lake Sakakawea, one of the largest lakes in the country here. We we could drop a submarine into that, the USS North Dakota, one one that I've had a chance to be on a couple times, but then we'd have all three legs here in North Dakota. But we we were in Japan in uh, October on a trade mission during that trade mission, North Korea shot a missile over the top of Japan. Uh, and and so seeing firsthand what's obviously that missile landed harmlessly in the ocean. But the Japanese understood that if a missile was going to go back at North Korea, it was going to come from North Dakota and not from, not from Japan. But thankfully, Japan, uh, who was obviously uh, – we fought against World War II. My dad was born in the same town that I grew up in. He went down the road to Castleton, North Dakota, signed up after Pearl Harbor. Uh, because he had a college degree, he became a um, naval officer, part of the 90-day wonder program, got dropped onto a freshly built destroyer, didn't see my mom for a couple years, and lived to tell about it. Because as you know, your history, uh, you know, 151 destroyers at Okinawa, 129 were hit by kamikazes. But he made it all the way to Tokyo Bay. And was there on his 28th birthday, September 2nd, 1945, when we, when Japan surrendered. Which what first, ship was he on, Governor? I'm interested in that because the twigs went down to a kamikaze and my mother-in-law's first husband was the skipper. And so I'm very interested in the destroyers off of Okinawa. Do you remember the name? Yeah, absolutely. The USS Wren, uh, named after uh, Solomon Wren, one of the sailors that was uh, in uh, 1803, was part of the group that in uh, fighting the Tripoli pirates that uh, successfully uh, stuck that is very the harbor. neat. That is very... Yeah. Governor, what by the way, what is your website so people who want to learn more about your bio and contribute or help your campaign can find you? 
Thank you, Hugh. DougBurgum.com, very simple. DougBurgum.com, would love to have everybody learn more about us there. Now, now, Governor, uh, very quickly, you're a governor, so you know how this works. Uh, the legislature sends you something. You can either su- sign it or not. In the federal system, you get one big swing every year if we have both the Senate and the House. Reconciliation. One big swing. One thing. President Trump tried to repeal Obamacare, failed. In his second big swing, he got the tax cut, and then he lost the majority. My question to you is, what do you want in your one big swing if Mitch McConnell gets the Senate back along with Steve Daines and the House stays under Kevin McCarthy and you're the president? What do you want in the reconciliation bill in 2025? Well, you know, I'm I'm someone who thinks we've got to be able to do more than one thing at a time, particularly in a country as ours at a time when we've got, uh, you know, the world's changing, the economy's changing, technology's changing, every job, every company, every industry. But one of those uh, things that we have to have is we've got to focus in that reconciliation thing that would fix the economy, where we're going on inflation, on spending, on fiscal policy, monetary policy, t- tax. That is, you know, hurting every American. That inflation is that hidden tax. Energy policy is 180 degrees wrong. We're literally, we're literally asking our adversaries to produce more energy at the same time the EPA and the SEC and others are trying to shut down American energy. This is the thing that makes the least amount of sense of all the things the Biden administration is doing. We've got to reverse course. It's one of the reasons why we're creating global instability is because of our energy policy. Putin never invades Ukraine if we don't have Western Europe, our allies, Japan, our allies. Japan, you know, has zero oil and gas. They're getting all of their energy from the Middle East. Western Europe was getting all their energy from Putin. This is just, it's complete insanity for us to not be providing clean U.S. energy to our allies, as opposed to us, the United States, the State Department, going to places like, you know, Venezuela in the Middle East and saying, could you please produce more? Or Biden, you know, draining the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in half ahead of the midterms to try to get, you know, gas prices down at the pump. That's not strategic. That's political. And so, Governor, would you stand by? I'm gonna. I got to go into a commercial break, but I want to ask you a couple more questions during the break, which will play on the podcast and keep coming back. DougBurgum.com. He needs forty thousand contributors if he's going to be on the debate stage. I'll ask him during the radio break whether or not he's there yet. And a couple more questions, and he'll be back off. And I'm back now with Governor Doug Burgum for five extra minutes that I'll put on the podcast today, Governor. Um, Abortion and guns matter in every presidential primary. What are your positions on those? Well, from the standpoint of guns, uh, lifetime, I'm a lifetime hunter, uh, lifetime gun owner. Uh, both my mom and dad were hunters. My mom was uh, loved uh, uh, duck hunting and pheasant hunting. First gun I had was a Ithaca 16-gauge shotgun that uh, came down from her. Um, so... You know, strong record, uh, top rating from the NRA on the on abortion. Uh, the that's just something where I'm a strong supporter of Dobbs, and this is a decision that has now been rightfully returned to the states, uh, and that's where that decision should stay. All right. So, in terms of um, back to the reconciliation question, you brought up energy. You really only get to do one thing in reconciliation. Would you address the energy imbalance and put everything back into production, including nuclear? Absolutely, uh, all of the above, and energy would have to be the top because, again, the things that matter the most to the most number of Americans is economy, energy, and national security. And energy, the, you, you can't separate those right now. Or the, no, you can't. The, no, you, can't. you cannot so I, uh, so, do that. But, but, but I was also going to say one of the things that's very you know dear and touching every family is 110,000 overdose deaths in our country in 2022. Uh, and this is a, you know, directly it has to be uh, at the feet of the Biden administration for having an open border. And if we're going to talk national security, national security means border security. And right now we do not have that in this country. So, Governor, to, to wrap up, though, in terms of getting on the debate stage, will you have the 40,000 contributions and 1 percent you need? Yeah, absolutely. We will. We're up on you know television in Ohio and New Hampshire this week. Uh, we've got a you know groundswell of support for our candidacy and uh, national network of uh, friends and business partners and others that are going to lift us up and we will absolutely be there. So governor, um, I'm glad you're on. I hope you keep coming back. The hard, the hardest hill you have to climb is that people don't know much about North Dakota. Are you finding their terrain on which to, to get a foothold? 
Well, sometimes it's uh, an advantage uh, it, to be, uh, you know, A, underestimated and unknown because we have a chance to tell a great story. In North Dakota, we've got an amazing story to tell. Uh, the state's on a path to being the highest GDP state in the nation. Uh, we've had cut historic taxes this year. We passed 51 of 52 uh, red tape reduction bills, which is, again, uh, we've got to focus on innovation, not regulation at the federal level. I've experienced all that federal red tape as a governor and as a business leader. Uh, I understand uh, we've got to get the government out of the way so we can unleash the American unleash okay, the American we have less, economy. Unleash it. we got less than a minute, Governor. Have you always voted Republican in the presidential elections, beginning with Gerald Ford? Uh, absolutely. And uh, and I you know grew up, and my mom was a Republican National Committee woman in 1968 oh. and, uh, through 72. Uh, and I'm sure she would have run again if my dad hadn't passed away in 71. But, yeah, I absolutely grew up in a Republican household and understand uh, what that what that means, of course, is returning the power to the state's limited government, uh, make the decisions closest to the people. Well, Governor, we will keep talking to you. Thank you for joining me, DougBurgum.com, uh, to get on the Burgum bandwagon. And I appreciate your spending the time with me this morning early and knowing about the triad, too. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Hugh.